Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining me. These are the readings and sermon for Sunday, April 24th. Let us begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. O God of life, you reach out to us amid our fears with the wounded hands of your risen Son. By your Spirit's breath, revive our faith in your mercy and strengthen us to be the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. A reading from Acts. When they had brought the apostles, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now a reading from Psalm 118, verses 14 through 29. <clears throat> The Lord is my strength and my song, and has become my salvation. Shouts of rejoicing and salvation echo in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord acts valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord indeed punished me sorely, but did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Here the righteous may enter. I give thanks to you, for you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, O Lord, save us. We pray to you, Lord, prosper our days. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and has given us light. Form a procession with branches up to the corners of the altar. You are my God and I will thank you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for the Lord is good. God's mercy endures forever. A reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> and now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, 
Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, wasn't with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Years ago, a letter appeared in the national news that was sent to a deceased person by the Indiana Department of Social Services. It read as follows. Your Social Security benefits will be stopped effective March 2008 because we received notice that you passed away. Please feel free to reapply if there is a change in your circumstances. May God bless you and have a good day. Well, in our gospel lesson, the Apostle Thomas was having a hard time believing the, believing the others that there had been a change in Jesus' circumstances until he was actually able to physically see him and touch him. I get the impression that Jesus appeared a second time just for Thomas' sake to help him out of his unbelief. Thomas's confession, my Lord and my God, is the most profound expression of Jesus' lordship and divinity to be found in all of Scripture. It goes beyond belief in what Thomas saw before him, the risen Jesus. It expresses the Christian belief in all of its fullness. My Lord is risen, my risen Lord is God, my Lord and my God. Because of the popularization of today's gospel lesson, the Doubting Thomas story, as it's become known, it might be supposed by some that Thomas was one of the more lackluster members of the original Twelve. But other gospel passages in which Thomas appears indicate otherwise. For example, earlier in John's gospel, we find that as Jesus is preparing the journey to Jerusalem, Thomas urges the other apostles to join him, saying, Let us go also, that we may die with him. At the Last Supper, Thomas seems more anxious than the rest to interpret Jesus' instructions correctly. Jesus says, I shall return to take you with me, so that where I am you may be also. You know the way to the place where I'm going. To which Thomas replies, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? But it is only after the resurrection, when Jesus appears in the upper room, that Thomas fully converts and says with utter conviction, My Lord and my God. Jesus uses this event to pronounce his blessing on every true Christian believer to come, saying, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The phrase, I believe in, is an expression of commitment and faith. For example, when we say the Apostles' Creed, we are affirming that this is a summary of the Christian faith which we believe in and are committed to. When we say we believe in someone like God, we identify with that person. We believe in the relationship that exists between us. 
We experience it and we say yes to it. We embrace it. We allow it to influence our lives, our views, and our actions. Perhaps you can think back and see how an experience of genuine friendship in which you trusted and believed in that person literally changed the course of your life. Author Marcus Bach, who is considered a leading authority on the world's religions before his death, once interviewed Joseph Meyer, the actor who for many years played the part of Jesus in a highly successful passion play. Mr. Meyer, who had enacted the role more than 4,000 times, told Mr. Bach a secret. Here's how the author describes the interview. Mr. Meyer said there was a period in the early history of the play when it seemed that the performances would never catch on. There was something about the production and the organization that just didn't click. Often he would meet with the rest of the cast and they would discuss the advisability of giving up and disbanding. Then something happened to turn the project from failure to success. Mr. Meyer said, <clears throat> One evening when I was playing the part of the Christ, as I had done many times before, and at night when there were very few people in the audience, I came to the lines in the play where Jesus says, why take ye thought for the morrow, O ye of little faith? On this particular night, I heard myself saying this line as I had often done, but something happened. For the first time, I asked myself, Joseph Meyer, why don't you have the will to believe these words with your heart? Don't just say them, believe them. Then he went on to say, like a flash, it dawned on me, that I had been playing the part of the Christ without actually believing as he believed or living the faith as he had lived it. I don't know whether the spectator sensed that I paused momentarily at this point, but something was happening to me. Belief, trust, conviction came to me. And from that moment on, a change took place in everything connected with the passion play and its future. As Jesus' present-day disciples, can we help but wonder how often we play the role of the Christ, speak his words or hear them spoken, and yet don't have the will to believe that they are indeed the words of life? Joseph Meyer, in his enactment of the Lord's passion and death, even hung upon a literal cross as Jesus did. But the miracle came only when suddenly he truly believed. That was his turning point. That was Thomas's turning point, and that is the turning point in every Christian's life. It is one thing to believe that Jesus is the beloved Son of God. It is quite another to believe in the Son of God. It is one thing to believe that Jesus reveals God's will to us in the Gospels. It is quite another to believe in what he says and do what he commands. It is one thing to have a mountaintop experience with Jesus. It is quite another to come down from that mountaintop with him. Again, in today's gospel lesson, the disciples are assembled for the second time since the resurrection. Jesus appears among them to encounter Thomas, who, not present at the first session, refuses to believe in the resurrection. Notice, though, Jesus shows neither irritation nor disappointment with Thomas. He simply invites Thomas to touch his hands and his side, and that is that as Thomas responds, My Lord and my God. My friends, as he did with Thomas and Peter and the others who would be his followers, Jesus lovingly comes to us during our moments of doubt and unbelief. He comes to us in the waters of holy baptism and offers himself to us in the bread and wine of holy communion. He invites us to perfect our faith by touching his wounds which lay open on the persons of our fellow brothers and sisters. Despite the noise and clamor of this present age, we still hear the calm, confident, reassuring, loving voice of our Lord inviting us into the mystery of faith. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet 
have come to believe. My Lord and my God, may all of us answer the call to not just hear those words, but to truly believe them, for they are the good news of this day. Amen. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all now and forevermore. Amen.